how does somebody face the world without the Lord on your side? How? How is it that you go in and out and live constantly in your own fears? How does a child of God not call on the name of the Lord when they are in trouble? And one should notice that Jesus did not ask for the angel. He didn't say, Lord, send me an angel. In his trouble and in his agony, the angel showed up. Praise the Lord. My name is Gwen Butler and I bring you greetings from the Sisterhood Connection. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, the Bible speaks about the importance of connection, where it encourages us to be perfectly joined together. We believe we have reimagined a ministry that will allow us to do just that. And we are so excited to tell you all about it. Most importantly, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Please save the date for Saturday, March 26 at 11.30 a.m. We invite you to join us virtually on any of our social media platforms or submit any questions beforehand to sisterhood at acogchicago.net. We look forward to connecting with you as we reset, rebuild, and reimagine ministry. God bless you. February is Black Heritage Month and where we celebrate the achievements of African-Americans. I'm filled with joy. We have three outstanding individuals who have not only taken on the job, but they've taken on the responsibility that goes with it. The people of this wonderful state of ours will benefit from their efforts. When we begin to think about the legacy that has been left to us, we have to consider ourselves blessed and honored to be prepared to leave a legacy uh, to those who are still coming uh, behind us. On behalf of my family, I certainly uh, accept this award from Secretary White. May God bless you in every way. When it comes to discrimination, and I've experienced discrimination many times, but it has not changed my belief that there's this big, wonderful world out there that we have to learn to live in peace and harmony with one another, help one another, do all you can to make this world a better place in which to live. Praise the Lord. My name is Yolanda Williams, and I am the volunteer administrator of the Servanthood Connection Ministry here at the Apostolic Church of God. We are a church of grace, family, hospitality, and service. Serving is what we are called to do, and that is just what we do here at Apostolic. Serve each other and our community. Family, if you are not already actively serving, please contact Servanthood Connection visit our website or mobile app and click on the serve button to sign up. You can also contact me directly by calling 773-256-4184 or email me at volunteer at acogchicago.net. Let's serve. Apostolic family, did you know that this April marks the 90th year of our annual Bible convention? For 90 years, the Apostolic Church of God has been empowering God's people and lifting up the name of Jesus. We are gearing up for a wonderful time. Stay tuned for more announcements on the Bible Conference.
how the Holy Spirit has allowed you not just to thrive, but to strive. You can, you can make it because the Holy Spirit is right there allowing you to strive through. You're not just standing still. The, the children of God don't sit still. We grow in grace. We move in grace. The world changes all the time, but a child of God, our path is already lit. The Lord knows how to make your crooked path straight. Praise the Lord and welcome to the Apostolic Church of God, empowered by the Word. Uh, we are so grateful uh, to have the saints of God here gathered in the Kenwood Sanctuary and to have you gathered worshiping with us online. I see Nettie, Anna, Mary, Ryan, Deborah, and many other of the saints who are giving God praise on our online church, and so we're just glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time, whether you're in the building or whether you're worshiping virtually, this is another day for us to partake of God's word and to be empowered by it. And certainly uh, our hearts are heavy, yet glad as we uh, celebrate the life and legacy of our First Lady Emerita, Sister Isabel Brazier, and we certainly Thank God for her and all that she means to our congregation, and we are praying for our pastor, for the entire First Family, and for uh, one another as we grieve and rejoice uh, together. And so the Bible lets us know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. So if you're hungry for the word, somebody shout, let's eat. eat. God, we come today to thank you and to honor and to praise you for all that you have done. We thank you for empowered by the word. And we thank you for the word because the word is what gives us an inheritance among them that are sanctified. We pray today, God, that you would bless today's Bible study, that we will be strengthened and encouraged, that we, Lord, will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for the sister that was up here earlier testifying about uh, an infirmity in her body and all who may be ill uh, in our sanctuary and worshiping online. We ask that you would touch their physical bodies. God, we pray for our pastor and for our first family and for our entire congregation that you will bless us as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of our matriarch, Sister Isabel Brazier. We ask your blessings upon our faith community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as you know, we are talking about the triumvirate of grace. And last week we said that there was an alliance between faith, hope, and love that God has given us any number of spiritual gifts to the body of Christ. But only three of those gifts all of us have, or each of us have, uh, and those three will remain throughout all of eternity. So all of us don't have the gift of prophecy. All of us don't have the gifts of healing and miracles. All of us don't have the gift of administration. But we do have the gift of faith, we have the gift of hope, and we have the gift of love, and the greatest of those three is love. We also talked about how that we are to grow in each of them, right? Our faith is to increase, our love is to increase, and our hope is to increase. And so today, we're going to look at how the three work together. We, we kind of laid the foundation last week. The, the sub-theme was the foundation of the alliance. The next two weeks, we'll talk about the function of the alliance, how, how they operate, how they collaborate. If they are an alliance, and I see if you're worshiping online, and we may have to see if we can pull this screen up at some point. I don't know. We have to talk about that uh, so you can see what they see online. Uh, but we're going to talk about the function of the alliance. And again, this idea and concept of a triumvirate comes from Roman history, because there were three, Crassus, 
uh, Julius Caesar, uh, and Pompey, who formed an alliance for seven years in Rome, and the three of them together dominated Roman politics. We know the history goes on to tell us that Julius Caesar kind of became the first emperor, and, and that's where we get Caesar and all that stuff from. And so Caesar is our love uh, kind of concept in this analogy, but that's where the concept of the triumvirate comes from. So as you look today at their function, uh, the first is the triumvirate in our acquittal. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We looked at it last week to establish that grace is our Rome. Grace is the place we stand in because at the end of the day, every spiritual gift is called a grace gift. It's a grace gift. So any gift we get from God is a result of the grace of God. And so we call those grace gifts. And so we stand in grace and we operate in all of the spiritual gifts. And in these three in particular, in the grace we stand in. So the triumvirate in our acquittal. That's, that's section number one for those who are taking notes. Uh, and of course, you can go online and read this stuff again too. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work of patience, and patience and experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So we're justified by faith. We rejoice in hope, and the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. So let's look at faith. Faith is how we are justified. So faith's role in this verse, and we're going to look at more, is how we are justified. Faith in the salvation God has made available to us through Jesus Christ is the means by which we are justified. Now, we said to be justified is to be acquitted, that we all stand before God as guilty. We come to him dead in trespasses and sins. And so if we stand before God guilty, the only thing he can do is sentence us to our judgment. So we needed someone who could serve as our substitute to live the life we could not live because we're born with a sin nature and who could take the punishment <laughs> for us so that God could still be just in his duties as the ultimate judge. And so Jesus lived the perfect life as a human being. He did not commit a single sin because he did not have a sin nature. Remember, he is the eternal son of God who became human. God became human. So he didn't have Adam's sin and nature that all of us have. So he was able to successfully go through his temptations with the devil, right? The, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Turn these stones into bread. So he was tempted to sin. Bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, jump off of this temple and, and let the angels catch you. But Jesus never succumbed to those temptations. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he had to overcome his desire not to want to go to the cross and obey God. So Jesus was tempted and tested, as the Bible says, in all points, in all categories. He was tested and tempted in all three of the categories, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so because he passed the test, he was able to be the sacrifice without spot of blemish that God would receive in our place. And because God received him, we got credit for what Jesus did, all right? 
And so therefore, God can say, I've punished all the sins that Isaac did when I punished Jesus, and I'm going to acquit Isaac based on Jesus' sinless life, all right? And so now when somebody preaches to me or teaches to me or witnesses to me about this Jesus, it is my faith in that information that causes God to declare me not guilty. It doesn't happen automatically, but I have to have faith. I have to have confidence that Jesus came into this world, died for my sins, rose again on the third day. When I believe that, then God says, not guilty. And we move on to the rest of our relationship with him. Faith is also how we have access, Sister Lewis, to the grace of God. So when I believe in the message of the gospel, Paul says that I now have access into this grace that I stand in. I'm now in a new position and a new condition, right? Because the access I have is to God himself. The children of Israel could never go in and have access to God, not into the Holy of Holies. Only Moses went in there and then the high priest who went once a year. They could go to the tabernacle or later the temple and bring their offering, but they couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. They couldn't even go in the holy place itself. They could only be in what was called the outer court. And so when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? The veil in the temple was torn which was symbolic that there was no longer a door barring us from having access to God, right? So when the author of Hebrews says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, he's picking up on Paul's thing that we now have access, that, that we can get into God's presence at any time without fear that we're going to die, that he's going to kill us, that, that something's going to happen to us because Access is the right or opportunity to address someone implying higher status of the person addressed. See, I just can't walk into the White House and say, yeah, I'm here to see my boy Joe. <laughs> it's not going to happen because I don't have access to the president. Even when I got to tour the White House, they, they directed our traffic <laughs> and kept us in certain sections of the White House. We saw the orange room and this room and that room and all that, and that was wonderful, but they never said, let us show you where the president sleeps. <laughs> you know, let, let's go take a look at the Oval Office. They never gave us that access because it was restricted. And prior to us being justified by faith in Christ, we could never have access to God. And even though we don't fully understand it because of our culture and times, but when you think about the president of the United States, the governor of the state of Illinois, the mayor of the city of Chicago, and think about, I could go into there and see them anytime. That's what Jesus did for us. That no matter where I am, I can always enter into the heavenly realm, the heavenly throne room, and have access and audience with God. And here's the good part about it. I don't have to wait till y'all come out. You know, all right, he has an appointment at 12 with Evangelist Anderson. We can get you in at 1 o'clock. No, it don't, it's not like that. It's like Brother Williams can be up there. Brother Williams can be up there. Brother Branch can be up there. And I can come on right in there with y'all too. And God treat us as if we there by ourselves. Because faith gives us access to the grace of God and justifies us. So what role does hope play? Hope here is the sphere of our rejoicing. He says we have access and rejoice in hope. So hope is the sphere. It, it, it's this dimension, if you will, where I rejoice in. It, I rejoice because of the salvation that has been made available to me. My hope causes me to rejoice. In other words, because last week's lesson, hope is expectation. 
It is expectation that I'm going to receive something that God has promised me. And so I have faith that gets me into God's presence and that acquits me of all of my crimes against God. And now hope comes along and says, Isaac, there's something you need to understand. There's some things you're going to have to go through. But as you go through, I want you to rejoice in your expectation that even though you're going to have some hardship, you're going to have some pain, you're going to have some suffering, you're going to have some people that do things to you that you're not going to like, but because you have an expectation that you're going to receive what I have promised you, you can rejoice in spite of everything that you find yourself going through because hope has the glory of God as its object. The reason Paul says that we rejoice in hope, he has the prepositional phrase of the glory of God. In other words, I want to make sure I get this right as I wrote it, the glory of God in this passage of scripture that we hope in is to be conformed into the image of Christ the restoration of all creation, and that God has for us in the new heaven and new earth. So one of the things I'm hoping for is to get my resurrected body, to be conformed into Christ's likeness, to get my resurrected body, and to have the moral nature of Christ so that this way that I live, even though I have God's nature, Sometimes bad words slip out of my mouth. I mean, may not, you know, so, sometimes uh, I, I may be mean, and I'm speaking for all of us. You know, I don't like to say you, 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 so don't think if I say, well, but, but sometimes I, I, I might want to beat people up. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes uh, I might have more wine than what was allowed by uh, the uh, inebriated metric there, you know what I'm saying? And so I feel a little tipsy, you know. So, see, when we, we do things, even though we're saved, because our souls are still being sanctified and our bodies have not been glorified. So our hope then to be conformed to the image of Christ is that I will be sin free, not only in my spirit, but in my lifestyle, right? All right. Also, then, my, my hope is in the new heaven and the new earth. And, and you all know, if nobody else in this church knows, that we all coming back down here. Jesus and the rest of us are coming back down here to live on earth, a purified, a recreated, a restored earth. I don't know what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. The Bible don't give us all those specifics other than to tell us that we got something to look forward to. That, that there's going to be a tree, Revelation 21, that will give us continual healing. That there would be no need for a sun because the light of Christ is going to give us the daylight that we need in the earth. We, we don't know exactly all we're going to get, but there are going to be rewards. And, and some people may be you know, janitors in the kingdom, you say, hey, it don't matter to me as long as I'm in, but there are others of us who are going to have other duties and responsibilities, and so we're going to figure it out. And then the other piece of that, again, is whatever God has for us in this new life. So, so faith justifies us, gives us access, hope helps us to rejoice in God's glory, and then love from God prevents hope from being disappointed. He says that the reason we rejoice in hope of the love of God is because tribulation works patience, right? So, so, so now he's telling me that I'm going to have some difficulties. So, so I, I can't expect that just because I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm not going to have no hardships, no afflictions, no difficulties. Things are going to happen even though you're saved. But it says it's going to help you to develop patience, to develop endurance. Uh-huh. And tribute patience is going to give me experience so that the next time I go through something similar, I know how to handle it because God brought me through it the other two times. You understand what I'm saying? 
So I've had some tribulation in my life. I endured that season of suffering. So when I come out of it, I now have an experience that I can draw back on. And then experience what? Gives me more hope. Because if he did it before, then I can expect for him to do it again. And then he says, and hope is not ashamed. In other words, my hope is not going to be disappointed. So I'm rejoicing, going back, in hope of the glory of God, because I know due to the fact God loves me, he's going to give me what I expect in the ultimate end. It's going to be rocky along the way, but I've endured it before. It's going to be tough along the road, but I got experience handling this. And my hope increases because as God continues to show himself faithful, then my expectation grows. And so now you get to the point that when trouble comes, you start looking for where to gift at. You understand what I'm saying? All right, God got a blessing for me, so my expectation, my hope is building up because I'm going through too much difficulty, too much hardship. And so at the end of this, the, the song, there's going to be glory after this. I'm no longer focused on my suffering. I'm saying, where is the blessing? Where is the glory that God has for me? But it's based on his love which Paul says is poured into our hearts. See, it, it, it's not a sprinkle. He says shed abroad in our hearts by the, it's poured into me. So the reason I got hope is because my heart is full of God's love. I know he loves me. And if I can get my eyes off the tribulation and remember that he loves me, I can get through it. That doesn't mean I'm not going to have to press my way, push my way, uh, continue to endure this hardship. But if I remember that there's a God who loves me and cares for me, if he allowed it to come into my life, I can handle it. The lump, I can handle it. The prostate, I can handle it. The loss of my loved one, I can handle it. My financial situation, I can handle it because I know he loves me. And if I know he loves me, then it's his responsibility to make sure I'm taken care of. My responsibility is to trust and expect and hope in his love. Are you with me? So how do you know he loves you, Ava Hayes? Because Paul says his love is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Because God's spirit lives in me, it lets me know that God loves me. Because you don't live where you're not loved. But because God has taken residence in my spirit, that's where he lives, in that immaterial part we can't touch, God's spirit, the Holy Spirit lives there and it helps me, Paul says, Roman 8, cry out, Abba, Father, right? Because he's there, I know he loves me because God lives in me. And so re in reality, God and me are going through this experience together. He's the paraclete. He, he's the one sent to walk alongside me through every storm of life so that when I start tripping, I say, wait, God's there. His presence is with me, so I'm going to be okay because his presence, the Holy Spirit, is God's collateral that there's more to come. See, the Holy Spirit is God's earnest payment for those who understand that. It's God's down payment. I just use the word collateral. More people can understand it. You give collateral to say that I'm going to make up whatever I owe you. So the Holy Spirit is God's collateral to say that you're going to get everything I promise you. The new heaven, the new earth, the rewards in heaven that are restored up for you, as well as your glorified body. So I got collateral. And I can always say, don't forget, I got collateral. I, I got your bicycle. You know, I got your car. I got the mortgage to your house. So 
So there's a, a faithful ending that has to come about. And so I got the Holy Spirit, Sister Brenda. I can run on and see what the end is going to be. So that's the triumvirate in our acquittal. Let's look at the triumvirate in our actions. How does the triumvirate work together in our actions? Let's get 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. 1 Peter 1, 20 through 22. And I'm going to insert the word Jesus just so we have a referent for who Paul is talking of. Peter is talking about Jesus, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit of unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So faith in God is the result of Christ's revelation. Faith in God is the result of Christ's revelation. See, God chose Christ to be the ransom for us before the foundation of the world, before the world was created. So before there was a beginning, you have to understand, and I don't know when that was, but before the beginning of time, God had already chosen that his son would be the ransom for our sins that his son would be the person who would pay the price for our sins. And so because of that, Christ was then made known so that we might trust in God. Because the God who had already made a provision to atone for all of my sins against him before sin was ever created, and committed by Adam and Eve in the garden, if you want to say Satan in, in heaven when he rebelled against God. But before Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, more importantly, before Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God had already had a plan in place that Jesus would be my ransom. He would be my payment because death was holding me hostage, saying, oh, you got to kill him because he's a sinner. And God said, oh, no, player, I already got this worked out, that, that you didn't know that my son is going to become human and he's going to be the ransom for Isaac. So you're going to have to let Isaac go and you're going to have to take Jesus and punish him. Are, are you with me? And so even though you and I have never seen Jesus, he was made known to us through the preaching of the gospel and our faith, what Paul is saying, Peter, I keep calling him Paul, what Peter is saying is that when we heard the gospel, we trusted in the message. That's what faith is. We had confidence that God was able through Jesus Christ to cleanse me of my sins, to restore me back to a right relationship with him and help me to overcome all the challenges that humanity faces. Faith in God is the result of Jesus' resurrection and glory. He says not only is our faith a result that Christ was made known to us, but our faith is in his resurrection. See, what makes me, talking about faith's role in this, in my actions, Faith helps me trust God, and I trust God because he raised Jesus up. You have to understand this. If Jesus doesn't get up, why should I trust God? Because the man, Christ Jesus, right? Jesus is all God and all human, and it gets difficult to try to parse this out from time to time, but you have to remember, the human, Jesus Christ, had to trust God that God was going to raise him from the dead. The human Christ Jesus had to trust 
that God was going to raise him up. And because God was faithful to his promise to Jesus, I can trust God to do the same for me. You understand? I, I can trust him because Jesus, the Bible says, is the first fruit. He is the first person to come out of the ground. <laughs> and so because he came out of the ground, if, if he tarries another hundred years, I don't think I live to be 148 years old. I guess I could, you know, but, but unless technology changes or they put me in some crypto chamber or something like that, I will not be here in another hundred years. But because Jesus' body came out of the ground, I believe in the resurrection, my body is going to come out of the ground too. And so I'm trusting God based on what he did for Jesus. That, that, that's what Paul, Peter is saying here. And he glorified him. To glorify is to honor him. So it's just enough if my body get back out the ground, I'm good. But Paul, I'm saying that right now, Philippians 2 says that because of Jesus' obedience, God gave him a name, what? That is above every name. He glorified him. He gave him authority over heaven and on earth. He gave a human being, God incarnate, but he gave the human being authority over heaven and earth. You have to understand this. There are always two dangers. We minimize Jesus's humanity at the expense of his divinity, or we minimize his divinity at the expense of his humanity, but it's both and, not either or. And so he made him and honored him, and so we expect God to honor us with whatever rewards he has for us for the deeds we do in this body, be they good or evil, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So that's faith, hope. Peter says that hope in God is the result of Jesus' resurrection and glory. So, so, so again, here, here, here's this combination. I told you faith and hope are kissing cousins. They, 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 they bosom buddies. They work together. Faith is trust. Hope is expectation to receive. And so he says, not only is our faith in the manifested Christ, but our hope is in him as well. Again, because I'm expecting, I'm expecting, just like everybody who was in line on last Thursday at all them different gas stations, they were in line expecting to get $50 worth of gas. And why were they expecting to get $50 worth of gas in their car? because they kept seeing cars getting pumped with $50 full of gas. So the line's moving forward. And every car that goes in that gas station gets a $50 fill up. So I have expectation, I have hope that my car gonna get filled up as well. So I not only trust that God's gonna do it for me, but as we elevate to hope, I expect that God's going to do it for me. So I'm trusting, but I'm also expecting for it to come to pass in my life. John Lang says, and I quote, thus faith becomes hope in God. He's saying it escalates or elevates who has done this miracle, talking about the resurrection. Hope appears here as a new feature super added to faith. Unquote. So faith get you in the door. We have access by faith into this grace. Hope makes me rejoice in what I plan to receive. You see what I'm saying? I'm just trusting to get in the door, but now that I'm in the door, I need some favors. You know, Mr. President, you know, uh, now, now that we're here, you know, I'd like to know that there, there, there's some issues in, in, with my business. I, it has some supply chain issues, and, and you can help me out with this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have an expectation that you've given me access. You're going to provide me with what I need. That, that's why they give all these dollars, these 10 and 20 and $30,000 uh, fundraising dinners, not because they believe in the person. It's because they want access. Because if I get access, I have an expectation that you're going to return the favor. I gave you the money to buy those campaign commercials, to hire workers, to get all of your messaging out and all that kind of stuff. And so now that I have access to you, here are my expectations to receive in return. And now love. 
Peter says, love for each other is the purpose for purifying our souls. So, so now I have faith. I got hope. But then he says, you got to love. See, because it's not just my vertical relationship with God, but it's my horizontal relationship with his hard-headed children as well. I understand what I'm saying. I got faith. I got hope. But he says, now I have to purify my soul. Because as I purify my soul by believing the gospel, right? The washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. As the gospel is preached to me, my soul has been cleansed. It's the sacrificial system, right? Symbolically, when I put my head on, hand on the head of that sheep or that bull or that pigeon if I'm poor, uh, poor and, and I bring it to the priest and he you know, slices the uh, animal's throat or rings the pigeon's neck, that's really supposed to be me. And so when they smear the blood on the altar, that is a sign of purification. Or when they burn the sacrifice on the altar, that is God symbolically purifying me of the sin I committed against him that required me to bring the sheep, to bring the goat, to bring the bull, to bring the pigeon uh, to him so that blood was shed. And so now that we believe the gospel, we got this expectation the reason I'm living holy is to love you. <laughs> well, it was tight last week when I talked about love and getting tight again. <laughs> See, he's, he, he set us up. Because now my faith, my actions, the triumphant in our actions, requires I love you. Because I can't be pure and not love you. Love finds its source in a pure heart and is to be done perseveringly. Let me go back to the scripture. He says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren. Here's his instruction. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So if you really are sanctified, if you really are holy, then who are you loving? Brother Frank, who, who are you loving? See, we are commanded to love each other fervently. He didn't say it was going to be easy. That's why he said fervently. <laughs> All right. That, that, that would be an adverb, right? Fervently, I think it would be. We are to love each other fervently because it's hard. <laughs> it is hard to love God's children. It's hard to love everybody, but for some reason, church folk make it harder because you know they know better. My coworker, yes, should have morals and ethics and values and all that stuff, but they don't claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. They don't claim to have the Holy Ghost. They don't claim to believe in the teachings of the Bible. They don't claim to go to church. But it's the folk that pray and speak in tongue and prophesy and shout up and down the aisles and in between the pews and swing from the chandeliers that be the ones that seem to give you the hardest of time. And that's why Peter says, be fervent <laughs> in how you love them. Because it has to come from a pure heart. See, see that, that, that's the thing. We talked about love a little bit last week. That my love for you, pulling back what we just talked about in justification, our acquittal, it's poured in my heart, the love of God. And so the love of God can come in and not go out. Because it's going to empty my reservoir to love you <laughs> the way God really wants me to love you. That's why he got to keep pouring. He got to keep pouring so that what comes in goes out, right? 
pour in, pour out, uh, pipo, I guess, you know, we got, you know, garbage in, garbage out, pipo, pour in, pour out. And so if I'm going to love you, God has to fill me with love. And then he has to help me have the love for you that he has for you. He has to help me have the love for you that he has for me. Because I'm just as much of a troublemaker to him than you are to me, or as you are to me. I'm just as stubborn and hard-headed and difficult as the person I'm dealing with. So when he reminds me how he loves me, I have to then love you. And so this is what this means. I have to have a warm regard. That's what love really means, a warm regard and interest for somebody else. I don't have to start with liking you, but I really have to see you as a child of God. If, if, if I can see you and care for you, I ain't got to like your ways, I ain't got to like your actions, but I have to remember that you're still God's child. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? Now, this is easier for me as a pastor because God works on you in that way, to, but, but he expects all of us to think that way that you have to see each other, we have to see each other as people who God has loved, God has called, God has created. The fact that we exist is a grace and a love of God, that we experience life, you know, and this is time I used to you know, pontificate on this kind of stuff because I'm kind of philosophical that I exist, you know, I'm not trying to get like some of the old philosophers, but the fact that we exist, we could not have come into existence, but God loved us enough to create us, to have this experience we call life. And then in addition to that, he also saved us and brought us into a relationship with him that you and I do not have to worry about hellfire and damnation. We can't comprehend, we don't know. All we know is there's gonna be uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, there's gonna be eternal torment. It's compared to a lake of fire and sulfur. I don't know what that means. It just don't sound good. You understand what I'm saying? It just don't sound good. And that's forever. You understand what I'm saying? That's for eternity. And so if he loved us enough Sister Antoinette and Sister Lisa, to save us from that, the least we can do is fervently put up with one another and love one another. Let's look at the triumvirate in our alternatives. Colossians chapter 1. The triumvirate in our alternatives. Chapter 1, verse 3 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. So he starts off with faith. Faith must be observable. He says we give God thanks since we've heard of your faith. That means that faith that is to be known is a faith that must be shown. Nobody can know about your faith if nobody sees your faith. That's why faith is an action. We, we talked about that three or four years ago. We did a series, Faith in Action. At least that was one of, the, one of our parts in that journey, faith in action, and we came from, from Hebrews, that faith has to be correlated to an action. If I don't act, if I don't take a step, I don't have faith. If you say to me, Elder Hayes, fall back and I'm going to catch you, faith is trust and confidence. I have to trust that you won't let me drop and I have to have the confidence that you can hold me up. Because I can trust that you will try to catch me, but you may not have the strength to hold me up. Or I can have the confidence that you would hold me up, but I don't know that you will hold me up. You understand what I'm saying? So if I trust God and I'm confident in him, 
then I will do whatever requires of me to become vulnerable so that I prove that I really trust and have confidence in him. He also says that faith has a location. It's in Christ. See, it's not only shown, but I don't have faith in faith because I don't know what faith is. But I have faith in a person. <laughs> My faith is in Christ because I can trust him. Why can you trust him? One, because he came from heaven to earth to help my butt out. You understand what I'm saying? He got whipped to his organs were showing. And that was before they made him carry the cross with his back and front side all opened up. You can see his liver and spleen and lungs and all that stuff. And they threw wood on top of that and said, carry that up that hill. And then they nailed him to it and then hung him up there for six hours. And every time he had to get a breath, he had to pull himself up. So he's rubbing his lung and whatever other organs are back there against this wood to get his breath so he don't die of asphyxiation. So if he's willing to do all of that for me, I can trust him. <laughs> I, I can count on him. I, I, I can depend on him. And so that's why my faith is in him. Let's look at love. I need more time. I only got four, four different scriptures, but love. Love must be observable. He said, I heard about your faith, but I also heard about your love. Your love. So that means that love must be shown to be known. So now we talking deep, Lord, I got a pure heart of love for the saints. I'm going to love them fervently. Well, how we know? Let, let me see that you love me. Here they, they were contributing to the saints in Jerusalem who were poor. Remember that the church was being persecuted in Jerusalem. And so Paul was going about to Corinth and to uh, all these other churches, Philippi and so forth, collecting offering to take back to the poor saints in Jerusalem because they were being cut off from their communities. Y'all Christ followers, we're not doing business with y'all no more. You know, we're we not helping y'all out. And so the church had to care for the saints. That's why you see them bringing their money to the apostles' feet because folk didn't have nothing. And so when he said, all right now, you Gentiles, the gospel and salvation is of the Jews, and so you owe them naturally for what they've done for you spiritually, and so you got to give finances to them to help them out because you've been richly blessed. And so he's saying to the saints in Colossae that we see your labor of love because you're raising money to send to help them out. And so love must be in us before it can flow from us. If you can't love, then I have to ask, is love really in you? Has the love of God been poured in you? Because if it's being poured and just spilling over all over the place and nobody's receiving it, it's going down the drain, then that would be an issue. That we are conduits, we are a pipeline from God to Christ, to us, to others, to the world. That, that's what was called a pipeline of love. From the Father to the Son, through the church to the world. And so people should see our love and feel our love. And then let's go to hope because we're running short on time. Faith in Christ and love for the saints are the result of hope. So the reason I love you is because, um, or I have hope rather, is because of my faith in Christ and my love for you. I'm loving you, expecting that God's going to bless me for loving you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I have faith, which leads to my hope. I think we've drilled on that enough. We, we, we don't have to go down on that. But also, I love you because I expect to be blessed by God. So when I'm loving you, I'm doing it because I don't want to have an issue with God. 
So I'm doing all I can. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've had folk, I prayed for it that day, and they attacked me that day after I prayed for them. You understand? I'm saying, God, what you want me to do? I done prayed for the people. You know what I'm saying? Today, this morning, Lord bless so-and-so. And then all kind of drama. I said, good God Almighty. Good God. I just pray. If y'all want my prayer back, give me my prayer back. <laughs> but you got to love. Because I'm loving them because I want to be right with him. You understand? As No matter what, they, they may treat me like a dog they found in a junkyard. But as long as I don't respond in kind and love them, I'm good with him. You understand what I'm saying? He, he going to have to handle them. You know what I'm saying? But I expect him to bless me because I'm doing what he requires of me. Let's go to our last one, the triumvirate in our afflictions. The triumvirate in our afflictions. Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Promise is, Sister Lisa, Sister Margaret, Ryan, Lucy, love starts first. Love must be demonstrated because it's an action, not an attitude. Some of this is kind of repeat because the Bible repeats itself, but love is an attitude. That's why I say you got to have a genuine regard here. It's an attitude and an action. It's an attitude and an action because I have to feel empathy for you to love you because there's something going on in your life that you just feel the need to make my life miserable. There is some pain, some emptiness, some void that you have that I'm the ire of your wrath. Like, like, and so now I don't like it, but I have an empathy for you because it tells me you're responding to me out of an issue in your life. One of the things, you know, when we help build the women's journey and one of the uh, things in the curriculum that we built is your issue with me is not my issue. <laughs> your issue with me is not my issue. So I'm not going to take ownership of it but in relation to our lesson, I'm still going to love you through it, right? Because that's what God does for me. And so when it comes to hope, hope requires diligence. Because I know loving you is labor. Because he said, your labor of love. It take work. I got to roll up my sleeves to love you. I have to be willing to dodge chairs, literally, to love you. I have to be willing to be insulted and humiliated to love you. And so it's going to require diligence. But my hope in loving you is that God is going to bring you out of your situation because at some point in time, love has to win. Love has to triumph. Some people don't know how to be loved, so they sabotage relationships. You got a good man, you got a good woman, but because you don't know how to deal with love, you sabotage the relationship 
And the wise person, the, the parent that has a kid that, that got hooked on drugs or caught up in a life of crime, you love them through because you understand that love covers a multitude of sins, that, that love wins the day, that you overwhelm them with love to the point that they feel shamed. This is why the Bible says, pray for your enemies. Give them water, give them food so you can put hot coals on the head. Now, it's not so you can give them the hot coals. It's so that they can feel shame about how they're treating you and change their behavior. And so to close out with faith, faith inherits the promise. So when I have love that I'm demonstrating to the saints of God, when I am maintaining my hope diligently that God's going to give me what I'm looking for because I'm loving you, I'm loving him, I'm, I'm doing all that I can, then I am confident that I'm going to inherit God's promises because faith and patience inherits the promises of God. So, so my love is helping my character because tribulation work of patience, some translations say character, and then patience, uh, endurance, and endurance hope. So I'm loving you through. But today, because I've learned how to love people, I have character. I can woosah. I can respond to your email tomorrow and not type. And so sometimes I might type, look here, you know good so-and-so. And then I wait till tomorrow. Yes, Lord, I'll wait till tomorrow. Because you're calm, you're cool. You know what I'm saying? You respond to that text message real time. Then they're going to be, Pastor, look. <laughs> this is what your church folks sending around to one another. And you in the pastor's office. So no, I'll get back to it later because faith and patience inherits the promise. So what's the big idea, Sister Mary? The triumvirate of grace works together to reinforce how we live out each of them. They, they all work together. The three, faith, hope, and love, work together to help one another. So faith helps hope and love. Love helps hope and faith. And hope helps all three. They're all helping each other. The application question, when it comes to your justification, and these are just the four areas I covered today, your lifestyle, your commitment to the scriptures, and your religious persecution, what is the state of your triumvirate? What is the state of your alliance of faith, hope, and love as it relates to your justification, as it relates to your lifestyle? as it relates to your commitment to the scriptures, which was going on in, in the church in Colossae, to your religious persecution, which was happening to the saints uh, who were being written to in the book of Hebrews. What is the status of those? Here's my challenge. Identify which one of these is the strongest and why. So are you stronger in faith? Are you stronger in hope? Are you stronger in love and why? Why? It may be that if you're strongest in faith, that you have the gift of faith. If you've taken a spiritual gift assessment, because remember, all these are spiritual gifts. They don't usually put hope on there because you can kind of tie it to love. But, but which one of these are you the strongest in and why? And then identify which of these you are the weakest in and how you can use the one you are strongest in to help build up the weakest one. So if I'm weakest in love, but I'm strongest in faith. How can I use faith to help increase my love? You understand what I'm saying? So which one am I strongest in? Which one am I weakest in? And then use the strongest one to help build up the weakest one so that you can have more parity among them. So we will continue next week with this. I got some more stuff. I'll show how they partner together in duos as well. I think I got a couple more uh, of them together. And then we'll look at how faith and love work together, how hope and love work together, how faith and love and so forth. Uh, and then we'll close out 
this triumvirate of grace on next week uh, in our final one of March. Uh, and if you're here today, you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, uh, we want to extend to you an invitation to, as some would say, become a member of our congregation, but really it means becoming a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, of entering to a right relationship with him. Because God sent Jesus into this world to die for our sins, that we could be in a right relationship with him. And in order for that to happen, in order for us to get that access, in order for us to be justified, we have to believe. And faith requires action. And so if you in this sanctuary requires you standing up out of your seat and coming down uh, these aisles for our baptismal committee to receive you. If you're wor uh, worshiping online, it is for you to contact us. There's uh, an email, uh, a crawl scrolling at the bottom of the screen there to tell you how to let us know that you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. And then we want you to come to Bible class on tomorrow night at 7 o'clock and be baptized in Jesus' name or come on Sunday at 9.10 or 11.40 a.m. and to be baptized in Jesus' name because baptism in water symbolizes our union with Christ, our, our allegiance to Jesus Christ. And so that's why we are baptized, not that the water does anything for us, but it symbolizes that we are now in a relationship with Jesus. And so if you're worshiping online, give us a call, email the email address, and let us know that you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. And then come tomorrow to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you're here now, come on out of your seat. We never assume that everybody in here is saved and giving their life to Christ. So if you're here, won't you come? Uh, let us pray. Lord, we just come today and thank you for those souls who have given their life to you. We pray that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you will help them to be connected to a faith community that will allow them to grow in their knowledge of Jesus Christ, to grow in the grace of God, and to experience all of the fullness of what you have in store for them. We pray that you will bless us, Lord, as we continue this journey, and we will give your name the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name, amen. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. We thank God for Diane and Crystal and for Karen and for all who are worshiping with us online and is now offering time at the Apostolic Church of God. Uh, please give uh, as God has prospered you. Uh, we strongly encourage everyone to please give something in this offering. Whether you're online, they have the ways to give right there online given through the website or the mobile app, the text to give. If you old fashioned, you want to write a check and, and send it in the mail, you could uh, do that as well. Uh, there's a QR code. You can scan that on your camera phone and it will pull up a link for you to access online giving. But we want you to give because God is blessed. We just talked about all that God has done for us in faith, hope and love, the gifts of faith, hope and love. And so one of the ways we show our thanksgiving with our praise with the lives we live, and with the resources we contribute so that somebody else can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our tithes and our offerings that allow the message of Jesus Christ to spread across Facebook and across uh, YouTube and across ACOG+, Plus, across WCIU on Sundays at 8 o'clock. All of that costs money to keep these lights on and to make sure that the temperature is, is, is regulated. All of that is a part of our tithes and our offerings. And so we pray that you will give as God has blessed you. Uh, let us pray. Lord, we thank you today for uh, how you've blessed us richly and reminded us of how you've given us faith, hope, and love and how they work together to help us to grow in the grace of God. We pray now that you will bless us uh, in the grace of giving, Lord, that you will help us to be able to provide to the work of the ministry that takes place at this church, that we'll be able to continue to support those who are in need, that the gospel will continue to be communicated, and that those in nursing homes and prisons and those who are homeless will be able to be blessed by our ministry. So, Lord, we ask that you will receive these offerings 
and these tithes that you will multiply them 100 fold for the use of your kingdom and that you will return them back to us 100 fold for our own personal use and we will give your name the honor the glory and the praise in jesus name amen ushers please come forward i do have a couple of announcements while they're coming one don't forget uh, that on yesterday, Evangelist Stevens' uh, Grace Talk uh, was uh, put up. So if you haven't had a chance to see that, you can catch it on YouTube or Facebook. It's still there. You didn't miss it. Uh, Elder Medias's are still there. Mine's are still up there. Uh, so you can go and catch those. Uh, also, if you missed first service, uh, a wonderful message preached uh, by our assistant pastor, uh, Evangelist Ivory Knuckles, about uh, faith for the journey. I encourage you to go and watch that again on any of our social media platforms. Uh, on tomorrow night, uh, you know we have a uh, Bible class and the gathering of the saints, so please uh, make yourselves available in-house preferably, but if not, you can uh, watch it online and tune in at seven o'clock. And of course, uh, if you are not aware, our uh, homegoing celebration for our First Lady Emerita, uh, Sister Isabel Brazier, is next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, so if you are able, please make yourself available to be a part of that great celebration. Uh, as Paul says, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. And I don't have to explain hope to you after the past two weeks because we have hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we cry, but we still have expectation that we will see her again. And that's next Tuesday, March 29th at 7 p.m. So let us stand for the benediction. And God bless you, Sister Sandra, Sister Deborah, Sister Lolita. It's good to have you all worship with us today. Let me bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, God bless you. See you all on tomorrow night. Amen.